Good afternoon, everybody. Can everyone hear me okay? Um, I'm still trying to work at, get used to Zoom here. I haven't used it a whole lot since the end of spring semester because I'm not teaching this summer, so I'm having to relearn some of these Zoom capabilities here. Um, my name is Christine Masters. I teach technical communication, professional writing. I'm the professional writing program coordinator in the English department. And welcome to this workshop on experience design strategies for your classroom. Um, we are recording the session today. And um, so just keep that in mind as you, you know, share, feel free to use the chat. Um, you will be able to share your microphone if you choose. I think I have the default video as not to share, but you, I think you can share that too if you choose. But mostly we'll just focus on my uh, PowerPoint presentation and my screen share of that today. Um, I believe you can see me in a little box on your screen. Um, I'm not completely sure. Maybe somebody could put in the chat, chat if you can see me. Uh, Elizabeth says yes. <laughs> so, okay, great. Um, and here, let me hide that so I can see. I can see, and, and Deborah says yes. So, okay. Uh, feel free to raise your hand or use the chat to ask questions as we go along, and we'll get started. So, first of all, whoops. Um, let's just talk a little bit about our anxieties going into fall semester. And some of you may be teaching this summer and some of you may um, have had this kind of pause during this pandemic and then we're going back in the fall. And so I'm going to try out this functionality of, of Zoom. And this might be kind of a, a new thing for some of us where we're gonna talk, like maybe annotate this whiteboard and talk a little bit about what we're worried about as we go into fall semester. Um, I've typed, pre-typed in some different things that I think that I'm worried about and maybe other people are, um, but I wanted to try out this stamp tool on Zoom in case you haven't used it already and see how this works, where you can go into your view options menu and then click the annotate feature and insert stamps or type your own answers to mark up this whiteboard and it's a way that the participants in the workshop can uh, all you know mark up the slide and participate in the presentation so go ahead and try that and um i'm going to try it here too the one I'm sharing my screen. Oh, there it is. I'm, I can't see my mouse all the time. So I clicked on annotate and then I'm clicking on, there's this little stamp tool. It has a little check mark by it. Um, mine, my default does, I don't know what yours is, but it has like an error, it has a heart, it has an X, a star. And so let's try that out and mark up the things that you are worried about for, for teaching in the fall. I'll give you guys all a minute to, to figure out how to use this. So some people are doing different shapes and some are doing stamps. And if you have anything else that you wanna add, you should be able to use the annotate tool to type in with your keyboard, other things. This is, this is cool. Um, Michelle's has an error or an arrow here. And then you can see this is where somebody typed in extra work for students and faculty. Right, there's a lot of kind of unknowns. Um, we had a little taste of having to go online in the spring, um, but now there, there's still a lot of unknowns, really how this is all gonna play out um, for the fall. So um, I think we're all kind of sharing a lot of the same concerns. So I'm gonna really quickly here take a screenshot of this. I can make my tools do that. Um, Oh, 
Oops. For some reason, I can't do this on the, this computer. But anyway, um, before we move on, I'm going to clear this. Otherwise, it will carry everything over to the next slide. So I'm going to clear this. And you, if you're using Zoom in your courses, you can also maybe try out this annotate tool. I'm clearing all drawings. Um, and then I'm going to the next slide here. So um, take a deep breath and we'll continue because I know when I think about this, I get I get very anxious. Um, but as I was thinking through what I teach in technical communication, I started teaching a unit on user experience design um, about a year or so ago. And I was thinking that the things that the strategies I teach with user experience design can really be applied actually to thinking through how, how I'm going to design my courses for the fall. And so um, there's a connection here to technical communication uh, where we often use a problem solving approach as we're trying to design communication. And of course, we're communicating with our students as teachers. So let, we can try to apply some of these same strategies. Um, if you teach, you already are a learner experience designer uh, in some ways, and you also function as a technical technical communicator in many ways because you are communicating um, expert knowledge to specific audiences that that is your students so um, there's always room for improvement and so we're going to talk about three areas today in the workshop um, what is experience design understanding uh, different experience design tools and then exploring different ideas for course design Okay, so first of all, what is experience design? And this is a brief introduction. Um, experience design broadly defined, it's a conceptual lens for designing systems that facilitate positive experiences. So I'll explain a little bit more specifically um, what that means. And you may have heard the term user experience before. Um, these are some of the different terms involved. XD can be the, you know, used as sort of an abbreviation for experience design. Um, when we're talking about industries and products, you'll hear the term user experience design. But then in education or when we're talking about course design, you might hear the term learner experience design. And so user experience could be abbreviated as UX and learner experience could be abbreviated as LX, right? And so the LXD or learner experience design is one conceptual lens for instructional design. And so there are a lot of different approaches for instructional design. Um, some of the user experience techniques have in some ways been translated into um, instructional design. So, um, in terms of ex uh, user experience, there are four elements, um, and this is actually just one framework for thinking about user experience, but Frank Go um, wrote an article um, in his website, UX Matters, and it's often referred to, where he talks about user experience as having four elements. Um, when you're thinking about designing products or systems, and so it doesn't have to just be a product, it could also be a system that somebody is experiencing, a user is experiencing. And so they're looking at, user experience designers are looking at whether the, the, the product or the system is useful, um, is it easy to use, um, is it easy for people to start using, and is it desirable or is it fun and engaging? And so user experience design, um, as sort of an emerging discipline in the past several years, draws from different existing disciplines such as psychology, engineering, and so that includes like industrial engineering or computer engineering, um, technical communication, and graphic design. It's really an interdisciplinary effort. And then some, um, you might have seen that some universities are offering majors in user experience design or minors, and if you look through job listings, you'll see that a lot of user experience jobs are kind of on the rise even though it hasn't really been a traditional you know, major or minor, but it's sort of an emerging field. Great. So um, 
So we'll watch this video here from Don Norman. Hi, I'm Angie Lee, and I'm here at the UX conference in San Francisco. I got to ask Don Norman what he thinks about the term UX. Once upon a time, a very long time ago, I was at Apple. And you know, we said, the experience of using these computers is weak. Uh, the experience, when you first discover it, when you see it in the store, when you buy it, when you, ooh, can't fit it into the car, it's in this great big box, it doesn't fit into the car, and when you finally do get it home, you're opening in the box up, and ooh, it looks scary, I don't know if I dare put this computer together. All of that is user experience. It's everything that touches upon your experience with the product, and it may not even be near the product, it may be when you're telling somebody else about it. That's what we meant when we devised the term user experience and set up what we call the user experience architects office at Apple to try to enhance things. Now Apple was already pretty good, so we were starting with a good product making it even better. Today that term has been horribly misused. It's used by people to say, I'm a user experience designer, I design websites or I design apps, and they have no clues to what they're doing and they think the experience is that simple device, the website or the app or who knows what? No, it's everything. It's the way you experience the world. It's the way you experience your life. It's the way you experience the service. Or, yeah, an app or a, or a computer system, but it's a system, it's everything. Got it? Emphasizing, um, you know, it's the use of a system. It's not necessarily just one app or one product. Um, here, let me go back to sharing the PowerPoint. Okay, we're back in the PowerPoint now. So Don Norman uses the metaphor of a box um, that when we buy a product, um, you know, we open the box and we're excited and um, hopefully we can use it. And, you know, Apple, who we worked for, is very good at designing things to be usable and engaging, right? And so we can think about translating this metaphor into our course design. Um, when students open the box of your course, um, what do they get? Like, are all the components already assembled? Are they going to need something else to put the course together? Um, are all the pieces jumbled? How easy is it for them to step in and use your course or be participate as um, your course in terms of, you know, if you think about it as a system, your course as like a system of activities. So we'll talk a little bit about more about that. But then of course, we never really can control how students experience our course because a lot of it depends on how, what their orientation is, what they, uh, what they bring to the table, how they're thinking about it. Um, and the course doesn't come in a box, right? It's not really a product, um, it's more than that. And so, depending on different motivations and situations students will all experience your course differently and so we're going to talk about ways to think through different experience student experiences and so let's do a whiteboard again and go ahead and open up your annotate feature and uh, maybe put a stamp or some kind of markup next to where where are the typical locations that students experience elements of your course And so these can be, you know, all, all the different elements that go into making your course, whether they're techn technology or, you know, in person. We got a lot of gold, a lot of people are using gold stars. I want to know how Michelle's getting her name on the arrow. That's really cool. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't. I don't know how to do that in Zoom yet, but yeah, um, a lot of people, you know, are saying Blackboard. A lot of us use YouTube. Um, you know, we have textbook websites often that we're using. Any place else that you can think of? How did? Where did they experience? I'm seeing. Um, oh, Elizabeth says she doesn't have the annotate toolbar. 
I think you might be able to get it if you hover over the top of your screen, it might appear. Um, it's hard to know how, because everybody customizes their own Zoom. Okay, well, she might be able to set it up. And Jacqueline says, I, she didn't, thought she was the only one who didn't see it. She uses Canvas and she uses Canvas. Okay. Erin says it's under view options. So sometimes depending on how you have your Zoom set up, it's hard, it, hard to know where to click to find all these things. And then, yeah, you can figure, you can always figure it out later. MOOCs for extra credit, right? The syllabus, that's an important place for information. Um, great, okay. So let me clear this. We've got that. I'm clearing so I can go to the next um, screen without having these drawings carry over. Okay, I'm clearing the drawings. We're gonna go to the next screen. Get back here, okay. So what I did when I was thinking about all the ways that students could experience one of my courses, I just made a brainstorm list of all the, the activities that I could think of that students participate in, right? And so um, you might have think of other things as well. And, um, you know, you could actually, you could annotate anything if you wanted to, to, to type in to the slides. But, um, you know, I'm not going to read the whole list, the whole list of things here, but there are a lot of different activities that um, people, that students participate in whether they're inside or outside of a classroom. Some typically happen outside of a classroom. Some can happen inside or outside of a classroom, um, kind of all depending on how you set up your course. Um, I'm reading the chat here. So Jacqueline says she just finished a two week seminar on Zoom and didn't have a lot of features. Um, she thinks she's using the web browser instead of the program. Oh yeah, there might be definite different um, options whether you're looking at it at Zoom in a web browser or you have the program installed on your desktop. Um, Michelle says she liked selected arrow and my name appeared. Okay, that's cool. All right. So we'll keep all of these different potential activities and in mind as we go through and think more about experience design. So um, I'm going to talk about two kind of typical tools that experienced designers use when um, working through experience design processes. And these are personas and journey maps. And so the first one I'll talk about are personas. And this is a, again from um, Don Norman's Nielsen Norman group, his website. This is the definition that they give of a persona. I'll give you a minute to read that. Um, personas aren't real people, but they should be realistic. It's sort of like um, when I teach personas in TechCom, I say, okay, here's where you get to do some creative writing. You get to imagine a fictional person who's also very realistic to imagine that this is the person receiving your communication or whatever project that you're working on. Um, and so, and Scott, so, Scott says, persona is also a term used in marketing. Yes, and the US, UX is marketing. Um, so a persona is like an architect type instead of an actual living human, but we'll describe them as if they're real people. Oops. Okay, and so this is an example of a persona. Um, targeted at someone who wants to use a web page. And so I purposely, I didn't make the, the print big enough for you to read in the presentation because I don't want you to have to stop listening to me and then read, so read something with this much text in the presentation. But um, it just gives you an example of how people use personas in industry. And so when somebody's thinking of how to write content for a web page, and um, this web page in particular is the about and careers page for a company website. And so the content writer would be thinking, okay, well, I want to make sure that all of the information I put on this page is relevant to the user. So who is it that's going to be using my web page? 
And so they'll make a persona um, to, to think about like, why would somebody be interested in the web page? Who are they? They'll, this is, you know, they find um, a photograph to visualize you know, and this isn't the real, this isn't actually isn't Rosa Cho, but it could be, um, you know, it could be a real, it's obviously a real person because it's a photograph, but it's not um, the persona. Well, you know what I mean. Anyway, so they're thinking of this as the potential user, giving her an age, a location, um, identifying maybe some quotes that she might say, um, some things that she's thinking as she's going to be using this web page, right? And so this is, um, this website, the, the uh, NN group has articles on personas. And if you want to get a copy of this or read more, you can go to this, this web page. Okay. And so that was an example from industry. But when we're thinking about learner personas, uh, we want to think about you know, who are our students. And we can make actual personas for our students. Um, one one kind of drawback that people or critique people have about personas is that they could easily lead to stereotypes and overgeneralizing. And so we try not to do that. Um, obviously, we don't want to stereotype our, our students or our, our users, but at the same time, we want to understand them and what motivates them. And so the purpose of creating a learner persona is to highlight details about their needs, attitudes, and behaviors. It also can be a useful tool for creating empathy and allowing us to shift kind of from our teacher perspective into um, identifying more with the students and what they're experiencing. Um, and then also it can help us in the next step and the next tool, which are journey maps. And um, so we'll, we'll use the personas as we then go ahead and think through the journey map. One real important part of user experience design is doing user experience or experience design research, right? And so before you design anything, you want to know, you know, who the actual users are and do research on them, right? And so there's a lot of different ways to do research. Um, the one that we're going to rely on right now is our own observations. You've already done a lot of, you know, personal observation of your students you know their preferences, you know their, you've heard about their life situations, right? And so we don't necessarily need to do a lot of traditional research like they would do in user um, experience research. Um, other methods would be, you know, like sometimes they do interviews or focus groups or questionnaires, some of the strategies that people would do in marketing. You could also do um, in user experience research, but we're going to rely on our personal observations. And so I put together this um, worksheet as a tool to use for creating personas. And there are a lot of different, if you Googled, you know, persona template, you would find a million different types of persona templates. And so I went through and looked at a bunch of them and I, in the ones that are specifically also for learner experience design. And I came up with kind of a list of, uh, I don't know, uh, form fields that we could fill in on this template to understand students and make a persona for, um, for different potential students. Okay, so also the template for this will be available. I'll have a link at the end of the presentation that you can go to to use, um, to download it if you want to use this. So here's one example. And in the first version of this workshop, I actually had people break out into different groups and I thought it was only going to take about 10 minutes, but it took about a half hour. So I decided in this, in this iteration of the workshop to not have us break out into different discussion groups. Um, but I just want to, we'll talk about how to fill out and what I had them do in the discussion in the small groups through Zoom were make a persona together as a collaborative group activity, right? And that also allows you to experience that functionality of Zoom, how you can actually, if you're teaching with Zoom, you can break your students out into different groups and then have them do solve a problem or do an exercise and then come back together with the main, um, the main uh, audience. We're not, we're not going to actually do that, um, 
it's a really cool feature. And, you know, maybe at the end, if we have time, I, we could just do it. To, if you guys want to experiment with it, I could do it with you and show you how to, to use it. But um, rather than have you fill out these personas with small groups, I'll just kind of go over a couple examples of the ones that I filled out. And so I made these based on um, not any one student, but sort of a, an amalgamation of different students I've known. Um, and I'm thinking of like my tech comm students primarily. And so this, this persona, uh, I've named him James Student, a really creative name here. Um, and you can get pictures, like anonymous pictures from randomuser.me if you wanna actually put a picture to visualize a persona. Put, put that in your document. Um, and he's a computer science major, and he's a junior. And then I made up a living and working situation for him. I'm not gonna go through and read everything line by line, but um, you, know, you wanna think about how they access the technology. Uh, in this case, he tends to use his phone. He doesn't have a laptop or other computer at home. He doesn't have Wi-Fi at home. And so when his data plan is out, He's kind of in a jam. Um, he'll go to the co university computer lab if he has to, um, or if he has to use Microsoft Word or something like that, but he really prefers not to because um, he, works, he works a lot, and so I mean, <laughs> motivations and anxieties. Um, he wants to work, do well in the class, but he often prioritizes his job and sleep. Um, and so, uh, you know, you can kind of like describe some of your different student situations and get into their mindset of how they're experiencing your, your class and what they want to get out of it. Accommodations, um, none requested. That would be like if you got a letter from the Office of Counseling and Testing, what their specific needs are for that. Um, and then think about their long-term goals, short and then course goals and course experience goals. And these are actually fairly similar. Um, the long-term goals, obviously like what they want to do after college, the course goals, um, you know, do they really have to make, there's some students that have to make an A at all costs. As you know, there's some who will just be happy to pass. Um, and he, for James, he just wants to get, he just wants to get a C if he gets overwhelmed. And some, you've probably seen this when we went online in the spring, some students, they just want to pass. They can't, it's like, they just don't want to deal with it, you know, and they kind of shut down. Um, and so um, course experience goals, he wants to be able to easily find and understand the course instructions. And then I just elaborated, you know, I'm a writer, I kind of elaborated on that. Um, he doesn't want to spend a whole lot of time on homework. Um, he wants to get all his questions answered on Blackboard. He doesn't feel like he can go to office hours, you know, and we all have students like that that just won't come to office hours, most of them. <laughs> but um, anyway, so that's an example of you know, one student persona. And then I have another one who I've called Ashley student, and I got a picture of her from the, the same uh, random user picture site. She's, um, she's younger, she's kind of more of our typical, um, she's a sophomore, sort of our typical on-campus student who, you know, is working part-time on campus. Uh, Elizabeth says, I know James student. <laughs> And so this student, she's actually a professional writing major. And so she's, you know, this is one of her major classes that she's taking if I'm writing it as, a t you know, for my tech comm class. Um, whereas James student, he has to take the class. He doesn't really want to take it. But this student, Ashley, she actually wants to take it. She's interested. Um, she wants to do well. She has all kinds of technology at her disposal. She has her own laptop. She has her own printer. Um, you know, she she only goes to the university computer lab if her printer is broken um, she has a letter from counseling and testing that she can take exams at their office or have longer time allowance um, and so this profile is the student who is always worried has to get straight a's you know doesn't necessarily um you know have a lot of creativity always in her projects she wants to do things right and have it be perfect and then I'm seeing that um, Elizabeth says how many of these student personas should we do that's really up to you I did I only did two as a way to kind of think through the journey map but you could do you know one or as many as you want um, it's really however it's going to be useful 
um, for you. And then it might make more sense as we talk about the next tool, the journey map, to think about how many, you know, do you really want to do how many of these. But I know we have probably, if you think about your typical students, there's at least, I mean, how many different types? Of, we, we have a few different kind of types of students, I think, um, that, uh, that we could probably identify that, you know, that we relate to across different departments. Um, so, okay. So that was the second example. Let me go to the next slide. Okay, wait, is that the next one? Yep, okay. So journey maps, so this is the next tool and it fits together with the persona. And what journey maps do is they allow us to visualize then our learner's pathway through the, either the entire course or just one part of the course. And so as I'm talking about journey maps, you can use them as you, could brainstorm and kind of plan your whole course, or you can just focus on one unit. You can just focus on um, uh, one class or you know one lesson plan or one activity, however you find it useful. And the purpose of doing, one of the main purposes is to identify where the pain points are. And so I'll explain a little bit more what that means. Um, and then aid in brain, brainstorming course design solutions. And so pain points, these are the areas of frustration for your students that aren't necessarily productive frustration. And you know when we teach, um, it's good, as we know, it's good for students to experience some frustration, right? Because when they have to solve a problem, then they you know, grow and they learn by solving problems. But if they're experiencing frustration unnecessarily or in a, ways, in a way that's really not productive, like they just can't find something, you know, then it's, it's not use, a useful uh, frustration. And so we're trying to figure out how to overcome those pain points that aren't necessarily productive. Okay. And so um, Elizabeth says, would you recommend surveying students, asking them about their lives? You could, yeah, that might be, that might be a good, um, you know, research, kind of research strategy too. Um, some people will do surveys, you know, at the beginning of, of the semester, um, trying to get to know their students and that could be, that could be useful too. And Jacqueline says, I always have them answer some questions under the discussion board so they get to know each other. Yeah. Um, you could even kind of, if you've done that in past classes, you could kind of take those and, you know, maybe generalize it a, a little bit about how students seem to be, where they're coming from. So this is the template for the learner journey map. And I'll give you this template, a link to it, to the Dropbox where I have this blank template um, at the end of the presentation. Um, again, I came up with this after looking through different templates for journey maps online. There's a bunch of different kinds out there. This looks actually a lot different than the one I use when I teach user experience and technical communication. Um, and again, you can do this for any type of class. You should be specific when you actually fill it out. Um, be specific if it's face-to-face. -face. Is it an online class? Is it hybrid? Um, are you filling out this journey map just for one activity or the entire class? you can put in um, their their name and their picture up here just to make it more you know real like okay this is the student how are they experiencing different elements of my class um, and one benefit of filling out a journey map is that it allows you to put onto paper things that you might already be thinking about and i know we're all thinking about all of this stuff you know as we, we plan for for the fall, but um, the journey map actually lets us, you know, it gives us a little template or framework to put the things that we're already thinking about down on paper. Um, okay, so we would, regardless of whether you're planning for a whole class or just one unit or one activity, you'd think about it in terms of a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? So there's a the student's journey through it. How are they moving through it? Um, what are they doing? What are the key steps at the beginning? What are the key steps at the middle? And I put more room for that because usually there's more going on in the middle. And then what are, how are they ending? Um, what are the learner goals? What are the processes, tools, and interfaces that they're using? 
Um, what are they thinking or feeling or questioning as they're going through this step in their journey? And then what are their pain points? And what are ideas and opportunities, things the instructor can do to alleviate some of these non-productive pain points? Um, and so here's an example, and I'll give you this example with the documents in the Dropbox. Um, I made it small so because I just wanted to focus on one part of it in the presentation. But this is for James Student. Um, I filled out the journey map for one unit of an online class for technical communication. And as you can see here, I, I put in his little picture and his name. So one thing that I'm focusing on is sort of in the middle of the unit, he gets easily, his pain point is that he gets easily confused about what's due. Um, he could be distracted, lacking interest, feeling overwhelmed by too much information with no clear pathway through it. And so brainstorming ideas in the yellow section, um, I'm trying to get better at using a central online interface to present the unit as having a clear path. Um, showing the steps more clearly, what he needs to do first, second, and third, but not, not that he has to like look one place for information, like check the syllabus, but then other information is somewhere else, right? So that there, it might be, actually the information might be located in different places, but there is one place on Blackboard where he can click with a link to that, the place he needs to go, so that he's not confused about where everything is. Um, and I'm reading through the comments now um, about how you were talking about different ways to do introductions, great ideas. And then Scott says, in discussion, I asked for something someone else might not know. Okay. Um, tools. Share my, okay, so you're talking about introductions and then Elizabeth just added, so to be clear, these are tools for instructors. Yes, these are tools, these are things your students will never see. These are just tools that you can use as an instructor to plan your course or design your course. Um, kind of from this, thinking about the student's experience of the course as you plan it, but students will never see um, these tools, the persona or the, the uh, journey map. So that was one example from James Student. And here's another example of a journey map that I made for Ashley Student. And this is a socially distanced face-to-face -face class, uh, as I am imagining teaching TechCom in the fall with um, students distance, in person, um, probably ideally wearing masks. And I think, well, I wrote this when I didn't know what the policy was gonna be yet, where we didn't have a clear policy about you know, students wearing masks on campus. So I wrote this back in, um, I think, early June. So one of her pain points is she feels awkward when doing group activities with discussions <laughs> with students from other, from six feet away. Um, she worries that some students are not wearing masks and ideally uh, they, they all will be wearing them if you have a face-to-face -face class. Um, Instead of group activities that require talking, so this was, that was the pain point, and then my brainstorm solution was, instead of having my typical group activities, where, you know, normally, I, every class I would have some sort of problem-solving problem, problem solving group activity, um, you know, I can't, I can't really see doing that the same way that I used to with, you know, trying to keep people socially distanced. So I was trying to think of different ways um, to, to have the group activities still happen, but in a responsible way, right? So I thought, well, maybe they could, you know, participate in discussions through technology. Um, and then I thought later after I wrote this, I thought, well, actually maybe a better idea would be to offload some of these group activities to discussion boards outside of class, things I normally would do in class, um, in groups I would do outside of class. Uh, through through Blackboard um, and um, using face-to-face -face class time as a Q&A session, right, as a review or Q&A session where students aren't necessarily interacting a whole lot with each other, but they're mostly just listening to me. Um, anyway, there's all different ways, that, you know, that we could set up, set these up, and we're going to talk more about them as we brainstorm ideas in the next section of the presentation. So um, 
exploring design ideas. There's lots of different things we could do. And so we'll think about how we're going to plan now for student experiences. Oh, oops, and I, I misspelled experiences and I never fixed it. <laughs> I noticed it in my last presentation and I didn't fix it. So sorry about that. Okay, so we'll talk about different course design ideas for face to face classroom learning and remote learning. Um, hybrid remote learning could be online or hybrid. Um, I'm, and I'm going to look through the comments here, try to catch up with reading the comments. So Scott says, have you considered using Zoom in the classroom for group activities? I thought about it. It might work. You might just have to try it. It's a good idea. And then um, can we assume that all students have phones so they can text? What about data plan limitations? Yeah, that's a good point. Do they all have phones? Uh, that might be something that you could survey them at the beginning of, of the class to know um, you know, do they have phones? If so, do they have a data limitation? Usually I think te texting doesn't use a whole lot of data if they're doing text messages. Um, depending on the apps that you might use, they would use more or less data. And so um, those are things to consider. Um, Scott says might also allow students unable to attend for any reason to participate. Yep, that's a great point. Um, and then Kathy says for Math 105, they're considering it. Um, I find Jacqueline says, I find that it's essential to have private chats with, with each student. Yes. Scott says Kahoot and other tools like Poll Everywhere, Kahoot, those types of things. Um, he says he intends to fit, flip the classroom and use the sessions together for more Q&A as previously mentioned and try it. Um, has anyone used Blackboard Collaborate feature? Michelle asks. And then Scott says, do we have enough bandwidth on campus for smartphones to use our network in the classroom? That's a good question. Okay, so um, I have used Blackboard Collaborate in the spring when we went online. Um, I didn't like it as well as Zoom. Uh, it was okay. Um, I'd have to think back of, I remember I didn't like it as well as Zoom, but I can't remember exactly why. So um, if we had, if I have a, Elizabeth says, um, if I, oh wait, I skipped, I skipped a couple. Jacqueline says, can you still only talk to six students at a time on Blackboard? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. Kathy says, are you giving out your cell number or using a masking program? I don't give out my cell number. Um, I wonder how other people handle that. I would probably, I'd probably use some sort of program where it would mask it. And then Elizabeth says, yeah, if I have a face-to-face -face class, I think I'll go more of a flip course, solving problems in class. Jacqueline says, no, I can rarely get online on campus. Yeah, a lot of people have problems getting online on campus. Um, Scott prefers Zoom to collaborate. Erin says they've been expanding the Wi-Fi in our building to support more students online. That's great. Um, Jacqueline says, if you have an iPhone, you can use your FMU email address for FaceTime. Oh, that's good. That's good to know. Okay. Okay. So anyway, we'll, we'll um, you guys can keep up with the comments. I'm going to go to the next slide. Oh, and somebody typed in, I use my home number, but students are respectful. That's good. It also might just depend on if you have a lot of students or a few students or, you know, what level they are. If you have like a ton of freshmen, I might not give out my number but if you know if i if i had a ton of freshmen i might not give up my number but if i have just like a few upper division students that are like my advisees i'd give them i give them my number or graduate students right so um let's talk about a little bit about remote learning and what that looks like i'm going to talk about remote learning first and then talk about face-to-face -face situations so remote learning um it occurred to me as i was thinking about setting up my blackboard courses for the fall that I really don't know what the student's Blackboard app looks like. Um, so I asked one of my students to send me screenshots of her Blackboard app because we have a Blackboard app that we can download as instructors and I've, I've tried it a little bit. I haven't really played too much around with it too much, but the, the app on the phone for Blackboard looks totally different than the one on the web browser. And so I think it's important to know what the students are seeing 
you know, in terms of experience design and how they're navigating through the information. So you can see here, um, this is my student Felicia's uh, screenshots of her, her Blackboard for Students app, which is totally different from the Blackboard for Instructors app. But turns out, I think it looks fairly similar when I compared this to my Blackboard for Instructors app. So when they look at their home screen, they see like all their courses. You can see she had me for like three courses last semester. Um, when they're looking at, a, this is the middle screen is for one course home landing page. They're seeing the grade, obviously. They're seeing items due, um, announcements, and then the course content, the collaborate. That's the one time I tried collaborate in that class that she was taking, and then discussions. And so it's interesting how Black, the Blackboard app pulls out certain things that um, it thinks are important for students to look at. And you, it might be totally different than what you're emphasizing on your web version of the class. So um, Jacqueline says there's a student view in Canvas so I can see what students see. There's also a student view in Blackboard, but not for the app. Um, Elizabeth says, I never know what students are seeing. You can't, yeah. It's sometimes, it's just hard to know what they're seeing. Um, and then announcements, this is the announcements page. And you can see I use announcements very heavily and I'll explain how I use it in my Blackboard setup, but um, all of her announcements are for me. <laughs> so this is what her, the, her app, the Blackboard app on her phone looks like. Um, oops, okay, so when we're thinking about possible student activities, this is that, this is the same list that I provided you earlier where my brainstorm list of the different things students could be doing. Um, this is, these are the exact same entries in that list, except for now they're visualized sort of as post-it notes. And this is another strategy that experienced designers will do sometimes when they're trying to th think about how to organize content. They'll put everything on a post-it note and move it around to figure out where they want it to go. And so, um, we can do this the same thing as we're thinking about how these things are playing out in our different platforms, like where, where are these different activities happening. It, I think it's really important um, too to think about the student perspective, uh, their journey, you know, the path that they're on. Um, do they know where they're supposed to go first, second, third, you know, last? Like, do they have like a ton of platforms they're trying to navigate and go from here to here to here? Um, I think it, it works best if you can try to put links to these things in one place so they're not always, you know, kind of confused about where they're going. And that's a good way to, to provide that clear journey for them or that clear pathway. Um, and then, you know, I think a lot of us are using a lot of these different platforms in our, in our classes and are either online uh, especially online, right? And some, a lot on hybrid, and even in face-to-face -face classes, we use a lot of these different avenues where students need to go. So when I was thinking about the interfaces for remote learning, like online classes, or just, you know, online aspects of, of regular or hybrid classes, it occurred to me that there seemed to be kind of two concepts for, design of these interfaces. The one concept, or the one design is this dashboard approach where um, the students see themselves as like a pilot sitting in front of the control panel, right? And they've got all these little windows, these different places they can, can click and navigate to. Um, and that's the default for Blackboard. Or are they you know, imagining themselves on a journey. And there's some interfaces that are better set up for, for doing that, for kind of showing students their path as if they're on a journey. Okay, so I'm gonna try to catch up with the comments here. Um, Scott says, publishers, tools are secure and convenient. Yeah, I agree. I use Launchpad for my TechCom book. Um, you can integrate certain ones with Blackboard and that works really well. You could also, um, with Launchpad, you can, and probably these other tools as well, you can set up your units, actually add things to their site, sort of instead of using Blackboard, you can use their site as your main place for students to, to navigate. Um, 
And Deborah says, what helps my students is the weekly tabs. There are folders that have things labeled. Yes, that's the same concept. When you have like a weekly tab and you tell them um, where things are, that's very helpful. That's the journey. That's actually a sort of a journey model where you provide them with a clear um, pathway. So this is one example of a web interface that does the um, journey model very well, I think. And it's the Adobe edX platform. These are free courses. I take a lot of these Adobe edX courses. They're MOOCs. Um, they're free uh, because I teach in design and in, in, um, uh, different Adobe apps like Premiere Pro when I teach video editing. And so when I want to go and get some professional education, I go to the MOOC and I go to the Adobe edX site. And I really like the way that they have things laid out because it, it's this journey model. It's where you're gonna go in and know what you have to do now, um, see what you've done in the past, see what you need to do in the future. And I think it's very satisfying for students when they, they could visualize themselves on a path. Um, this class, this basic principles of design, I actually just signed up for it. I don't know if I'm really gonna complete it, but um, I know a lot of this stuff already, but I wanted to show you as an example um, this particular class doesn't have any live sessions, but the best Adobe classes that I've taken are ones where one of these, like one of these little entries in their list would be attend the live class session, a live online class. And the way they handle it is really good, I think, because they have like a, it's a, they have a mini lecture in the, their live session. They have like a little mini lecture where they have a couple of different presenters and sometimes a guest speaker talking and they cover the topics that you already were supposed to go over in the unit and then um, you do q a and a lot of people chat there's like thousands of people online right it's like it's it's a it's a massive um, online course um, but and then if you can't actually attend that live session you can go back and you have to actually they, they require you to go back and watch the recording of course they don't know if you just skip through it or not but um, you're supposed to go back and watch the recording if you miss the live class. And that having that element, that live class element um, within the unit, I think is very helpful for keeping that student engagement um, so that it's not complete. It could be asynchronous. The class could be asynchronous, but um, it doesn't have to be. So if students really thrive on that engagement of having that live class, they get to attend it. Um, and feel, you know, feel like they're connected to a live instructor. Um, but then again, if they have technological limitations and they can't participate on the online, the live class, they can go back and watch the recording. So I think that's a really good strategy that Adobe uses that um, I'm probably going to use when I, um, when I teach in the future. I'm going to try, try something like that. So when we think about our our affordance is what we have available as our defaults. Um, you know, we all have Blackboard um, available to use. Jacqueline mentioned she uses Canvas um, as a, you know, an alternative. And I know some, I know some instructors who use like um, different different platforms that are similar content learning management system software. Um, that they like better than Blackboard. But Blackboard actually could really be customized a lot more than many people realize. And so this is the default course landing page for Blackboard. And again, it's this dashboard model where there's all these different boxes and students have to navigate around and see where do they want to click, where are they going, what are they doing. And I think that if you actually did a testing, like a um, you know, if you were to observe students using this interface, you would see they probably really only click in a couple different places. They don't use all of the stuff that's on the default dashboard model. Um, and a lot of it is just sort of like extra stuff they don't need. And so what I do when I set up my Blackboard course is I set, um, I try to have more of a journey concept um, of sorts where I'm thinking about them experiencing a pathway through the course. And so I use announcements as my landing page because I want them to be able to look back chronologically and see what we've been doing. Um, and so the, the new announcements will come up here at the top of the page. 
I could also pin an announcement to the top if I wanted it to always be there. But I really love this announcement feature of Adobe, or not Adobe, <laughs> Blackboard, because um, it lets me also click that little box that, where it goes to the email. So um, I put in an announcement, and then every time I make an announcement, it goes to their email. So, you know, wherever they are, if they have their email set to ding their phone, they get a notice that they have an announcement. Um, I think it does that even if you don't send it to email. I think they always get a notice that they have an announcement, but they can actually read it in their email if you click that box. And so um, announcements can be helpful to showing that chronology of if they wanted to go scroll back down through the announcements, they could see from the beginning of the class what we've been doing. Um, and then I customize my, my uh, navigation bar here where I put a link to the announcements. I think you have to actually set up announcements before it lets you put in this link. And then I put a link to my textbook. So that's my Launchpad site. Um, I add some of these things in later, like the final exam wasn't showing up there at the beginning of the class. I put it in later. But I do put in a placeholder for all my units, like the different units I'm going to cover as part of the class. And I don't always make them available right away. So, you know, if I want to take time to finish my unit before I publish it. I, I just put, I at least put a placeholder here so they know what's coming, even if they can't view the material yet. And then when they click on these units, then they would see that, you know, sort of step by step. Okay, here's what you have to do in this unit. Do this and then do that and do that. And so I think this is a really kind of easy way to customize Blackboard um, where you can, you know, make, make it more of a journey pathway model for students. And I'm, let me catch up with the comments here. Um, Jacqueline doesn't like Blackboard. Yes, it's it, it people, a lot of people critique Blackboard. I've heard a lot of critiques of Blackboard. It's, in my opinion, it's not the best um, learning management system, but I think we can do a lot more with it than we realize sometimes. And um, I'm making it work for now. So, um, Let's see, how can you use Blackboard for teaching when you can only talk to six students at a time? I don't know how, why you can only talk to six students at a time. Uh, only six people can talk at the same time. Okay, I've, I'll have to talk to you more about that, Jacqueline, because I've never noticed that. Okay, so let's see, the next, the next thing I wanted to talk about was, um, Thinking about the face-to-face -face classroom as having sort of learning interfaces, right? We normally talk about web interfaces or online interfaces, but we have like different affordances in the classroom that we could um, maybe design in different ways um, in person or by using technology to make the classroom experience better, um, especially now that we've got social distancing, which makes everything more complicated. So um, I think it's important to decide then which of the activities you would normally do in your classroom, which, which are going to need to be moved online, sort of make, I mean, even if your class isn't officially hy called hybrid, it can sort of be hybrid if you flip the classroom um, and put some of these activities online instead, um, you know, by using like, Kahoot, like Scott mentioned, or Poll Everywhere, or different things where students would use their phone. Um, and again, there's the question of data and access um, to, to respond to, with technology rather than having a lot of talking going on, right? Especially since we've got masks and um, my, the communication is going to be difficult, right? So um, one thing that has come up now with my one of my classes is I had a student email me asking and it's a regular face to face class both of my sections of techcom are are regular classes I haven't made any request to go online um, but I did have one student who's really scared of uh, you know she has some pre existing health conditions and she doesn't want to have to come to class and she wanted to do the class online and then I thought okay well this is gonna be really complicated. I would design an online class completely dis different than I would design a face-to-face -face class. And how am I gonna make sure that their experiences are equitable? So um, we, she ended, I ended up talking to, um, you know, 
my department chair and actually talked to the Office of Counseling and Testing. And she didn't qualify for the, um, what's it called, the ADA. So sh there's nothing that says she has to be able to do the class online because it's technically a face-to-face -face class. But I did tell her that I would work out a way for her to do the class online. And I think that if you go with that idea where you're going to offload a lot of these group activities that involve, you know, used to involve student contact or talking together in close quarters, put those online and sort of, you know, flip the classroom so that she still gets those experiences when she's, you know, she's online, the same as the students in class, but um, the, you know, the activities that are going to be happening in class would be things that are very low, uh, lower risk than what we used to do before social distancing. So um, I'm trying to think of ways I can use technology uh, to mediate some of those, um, those group activities. Um, let's catch up with the comments here. Um, yeah, Elizabeth says, I often teach the same class online and face-to-face -face in the se semester, the same semester. It's a challenge, right? Because you set things up different ways. So, Here's one idea I have for kind of making my my class isn't officially listed as hybrid, but I'm thinking of it in terms of more of a hybrid structure um, for social distancing. So this is how I would probably I'm probably going to design, and I haven't you know I haven't designed <laughs> I haven't finished my syllabi or anything yet, so I haven't gotten that far. But this is how I think I'm going to approach my units, and um, at least in TechCon and probably my other classes too, is I'll have readings or videos with the content, you know, assign readings, assign videos where I'm speaking, and then have a quiz on those because as we know, students don't, won't do the readings or watch the record video unless they have to. <laughs> um, and so, and, you know, at least most of the time. And then um, have a discussion board post. So each student would do a post, each student would do comments on the post, um, a certain number of required comments. So they've already engaged with the material before they come to the face-to-face -face class. Um, and the face-to-face -face class would be focused on review Q and, and Q&A. And then I'll record it for students who are unable to attend, or I might just do a live Zoom. I haven't quite worked that out yet and have a, and have a recording. But in any case, I'd want to make it you know, sort of like all the students, whether they're participating from home or they're participating in the class would have a similar experience as much as possible. And then I'd repeat these steps um, until I cover all the unit material and then I'd have an assessment at the end, which would be a larger project that, you know, some of the discussions and things might scaffold into or, um, you know, an exam probably more often than not with writing, I, we use projects. And then sometimes, you know, uh, writing instructors will have drafts due before um, before the final uh, project is due for for feedback and comments. And so I could put stagger those in there as well. So this is one idea. There are probably a lot of different ways to do this, but um, I think this is what's feeling kind of right for me right now when I'm thinking about um, my in person classes. But in any case, uh, any remote elements that you have, I think it's really important to make them easy to navigate, um, where you have sequ sequential links to other things from one primary interface. I think that's really helpful for students to have that. Um, you know, so if you, you have a link, you have everything in one place, you have like a link to your syllabus is in one place. You have like step-by-step, -step, you know, here's what you need to read, here's what you need to watch, you know, here's it's all in one place so they can come back and see where they are, where they've been, where they are, where they're going. So um, we're coming to the end of the workshop and I wanted to take a little bit more time to talk and hear your ideas and if you want to un unmute your microphone and at this point chime in, um, we can talk a little bit more. What are you all thinking? Hi, Christine, can you hear me? I can hear you very softly. <laughs> okay, I'll speak up. Um, I was wondering, does anybody use the, um, where there's a part of the uh, work, they have to say that they completed it before they can move on to something else? I've seen this in 
uh, some webinars that I've been doing, but um, I, I don't do it myself. I was just wondering if people found it helpful where um, you force people to do certain activities before they can move on to other activities. Um, I do. I, it's prerequisites and because I teach writing, I want them to do the assignments in a certain order. So they have to, for some assignments, um, for certain sections of my course, they have to complete um, like the writing assignment for week two before you can go to week three. Mm -hmm. Hi, this okay. is Kathy McCoy. Similar in math, um, the entry level math classes, a lot of times we um, set in the math 105, they have to make an 80% on an assignment before the next one will open. And um, we use Pearson, my math lab. So um, it's definitely been helpful for those entry level freshmen um, because it forces them to have to have worked it to a certain degree before they move on. Mm -hmm. This is I, Michelle Norman. Oh, go ahead, Michelle. I've used it a couple of times for different reasons. Um, one, in my content, if I wanted to make sure that they covered certain things in a sequence. And also, I've used it for examinations where I wanted to make sure that they completed a certain task before they took a quiz and the quiz would open up once they got to the end of that particular task. And it worked well. Great. I'd love to be able to use that. I haven't quite figured out how to make it work in Blackboard where like the next thing only releases after the first thing. I mean, you could always just refuse to grade things if they haven't done them in order, but um, I haven't actually figured out, I mean, so Kathy Same. mentioned Pearson, what do you use to kind of prevent things from being released next? In Pearson, it's really nice because you can set, um, set it up with um, prereqs. So yes. the, the previous assignment has to be completed to 80% before the next one opens. Um, I think what you're talking about in Blackboard does rely, it's called adaptive release. And I haven't used it a lot, so I can't tell you too much. We only use it for opening tests. But with adaptive release, um, I think it relies on you staying on top of grading. And so something will have to be graded to a certain percentage before the next thing opens. So that's where I would okay. look for that. Okay. And Michelle, what did you say you used for, for that? Um, I actually didn't use it in Blackboard at the time I was using Canvas, but it was um, an adaptive release okay. that um, it allowed me to set it up so that once they completed, uh, like I, I created a task that was ungraded, um, but it still needed to be completed. And then the adaptive release um, allowed me to set it so that the next one would open. Kind of, it's kind of like the idea in PowerPoint where the next slide won't open until you actually click or something like that. Right, okay. Okay, yeah. I'll look into that. That would be helpful. Other thoughts or ideas or problems you want to talk about? This is Kathy. I have a question. Um, sorry, Michelle. I didn't really... um, so it, this summer I'm teaching a course and I opened up a, a couple of discussion um, po um, places, but one of them, like I opened for an extra credit for them to share links with each other of information that they found that would extend the information. And most of them report, um, participated in that because I would give you like an extra credit point if you shared something unique with your classmates. But then I posted one where I really was trying to encourage the students to communicate with each other about um, the content, but it was really sort of like a question and answer, not, a, not an assignment. Like I have those question post assignments, but I had one that I called something like, you know, like a, a what's that? or something where mm -hmm. the students could pose a question that their classmates could answer for them. Not a single student has used that one at all. And I'm wondering what, what could I have done differently to encourage them to communicate with each other 
in a way that it does not require credit or points in order for them to do so? That's a, that's a good question. I've often also had that question. <laughs> um, has anybody found anything that, that works for them? Oh, I was typing it, but I, um, they're required to respond to two discussion posts. Yeah, I've done that before too, like required the responses to discussion posts. And like, of course, they all just want to do something just like, you know, short and not in depth and they don't, it's like they're doing it because they have to, but I think you can, you can set up, you know, requirements for grading, right, that, that will make them do a better job. But um, how do you how do you motivate them to participate when they're not graded and when it's not re like required? Let me clarify. I do have the discussion posts along with a rubric that allows them to answer the ones that are for grading. I right. do have these assignments out there. This one, I wanted them to communicate with each other outside of a, a graded assignment. Just right. like you would have in class, right. you know, you often find students who would communicate with each other and say, hey, like, did you understand what that meant? Or um, did anybody get this? And I, I wanted that kind of place that would be safe for them to communicate with each other. You're not worried about grading it. And it wasn't for me to answer, it was for students and not a single person posted anything. Hmm. Yeah, I've, I've had the same experience where I want to have some sort of organic, you know, discussion that's not graded, right? But it just, it's like they won't do it unless they have to. And I don't, I haven't found any way to encourage that. Maybe it's just the fact that they know that we can see it, <laughs> you know, and if they really want to talk to each other, they'll go like message each other off, you know, off of Blackboard or off of the course system or whatever. Um, but one thing that I tried at a previous university, and it was built around specific assignments where they could ask each other for help, um, it allowed anonymous posting. And I think that that helped because they were nervous to ask any questions. Um, to their classmates that might seem stupid or whatever. And so allowing anonymous posting helped. Um, that I did, we were using Canvas at that university. And so you could add in Piazza, which allows also for them to post it oh, yeah. anonymously to their classmates, but to let me see who the author was. I think in Blackboard, you can maybe do anonymous, but not that extra feature. Um, but that might be one thing to try. Okay. I haven't tried that here yet. I couldn't think of a good reason to allow anonymous posts, but that's a good one. Thank <laughs> We were thinking about using the discussion, the frequently asked question of taking the questions we get and posting them in there um, and trying that as a launching, um, a way to launch that so that um, if a student asked the same question, then we could say, well, go to the frequently asked questions. It's already there and been answered. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe kind of, um, was it priming the well? <laughs> Getting it started for them so they see how to use it? That's a good point. They might just not want to, you know, they might not see the value in it. And so they don't have an example to go off of. So if you do, if you do that, you're like giving them an example. Mm-hmm. Are you viewing it as kind of asynchronous office hours then? Or? That's not how we're using it. Um, it's more about uh, sometimes we just get the same question over and over again, uh, especially at the start of the semester. You know, how do I how do I log into my math lab? And so even though we've sent out the handout on how to do it, we've explained it in class, we've walked them through it in class, we'll still get the question. So what we're thinking about is taking those, anything that we, we seem like we're getting over and over again by the student who didn't pay attention in class, <laughs> that um, we're gonna seed those questions into there. So that way we're not retyping the answer, we're not um, getting frustrated with them, just saying, hey, it's already been answered, go there. So we're, that's what we're gonna try with the, those entry level freshmen in our Math 105 classes. Mm -hmm. 
So um, one, one thing Aaron mentioned was the idea of asynchronous office hours. And I've never really heard that term before. And I was wondering, Aaron, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Like, what, do, you, do you do asynchronous office hours? And what does that mean? Oh, no, I don't. I, it just sounded to me like that's what we were getting to with the FAQ oh, okay. or something. So no, sorry. OK. Yeah, I, that's that's one one thing one point of frustration I've heard my colleagues say that you know they have office hours and nobody comes, um, you know like you're on, online. I mean you know like tw well in person too obviously, but but you know like you set up, uh, you said oh and Elizabeth says she does asynchronous office hours. What async asynchronous would mean mean like you're not okay. Yeah. So synchronous would be you're there, but asynchronous means you're not actually there so sort of like a message board i guess so um, that is what i actually called that thing i was describing a few minutes ago was asynchronous i called it online office hours oh, um, okay and it i mean i had regular office hours too but this was specifically for these like assignments it was in more of a like statistics type class um okay. and so, so the idea was they could post a question and then it, they were encouraged to respond to each other i would respond if no one did if no one else got to it but mm -hmm. it gave them the ability to get a question answered sooner either by me or someone else um, mm -hmm. and then everyone else could see that question so it did cut down on what someone else was mentioning about the you know having to answer the same question 10 times or something like that um, right. it gave them a way to all kind of build off each other's problems um, so I, I mean I tried doing it briefly this spring when we went online but didn't model how to use it at all. Like someone said, you know, it's the idea of like kind of seeding the system with a question or something like that. Um, and no one used it then. I also didn't turn on the anonymous feature then. Uh, so I don't know if that would have changed things. Mm -hmm. um, but that was my thinking of how to use it. Right. Yeah. Has anybody done um, evening office hours uh, in the spring once we went online? So doing it out of our normal, not quote, nine to five time. I think that I did it once, but then um, I teach uh, some of our uh, like survey courses on Mondays and Wednesdays, so I'm all, I'm there late anyway. But I think that that's a good point. Yes, I, I teach. Um, I have my office hours sometimes at night. It depends on the class and what the students want. But I also teach the MBA, so um, I'm I do that a lot of times on Saturdays. So Saturdays. Yeah, Saturday morning for the working people. Sometimes that's early, uh, easier for them. Wow, I haven't done that since I lived in Burkina Faso. That's pretty <laughs> wild. Wow. Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense for you know for people who work forty hours a week and you know standard nine to five jobs. But you know we're home all the time now anyway. But I I'm trying to have better boundaries. But I'm I'm going to think <laughs> about that. Yeah. Yeah. I've often thought about looking at the time because I can see what time my students work on their assignments in my math lab. I've often thought if I had office hours at like 10 p.m. I would probably be slammed with students because that's when they're actually working on it. So I think quite often the time that we have office hours, they're just not working on the material to need help at that time. That's a great point. Yeah, they're often working on it like at 10, 11, midnight, you know. Uh, I think... I think the students that I've known, they work a lot of hours and they work weird hours too. So sometimes they're working nighttime or uh, so or during the day. So it's hard for them to um, come. Like if you have office hours from 12 to 2 or something, sometimes they can't make it. So you have to be a little bit adaptive uh, for those situations. If we move entirely online, I think that this is something we should consider. Um, I don't know if this is the appropriate time to say it, but I'm teaching an online class and I had video conferences last week. And the first time I met the student, he was so forthcoming about the challenges that he's been dealing with just doing stuff online. He was just so grateful he could actually see and talk to someone. So I think it's something we should all think about. <coughs> Excuse yeah. me. Yeah, I've, I've read a lot on like online, again, on social media about like educators trying to, you know, say, oh, everything should be asynchronous, you know, you need to be respectful of your students that they might not all have access. Um, but then, I, you know, like Jacqueline, Jacqueline said, and also my own two, I have two high schoolers, 
And I saw how when they didn't have an opportunity to participate with their teacher, their level of interest just went down, you know, down. They just sort of like checked out. It was really hard for them to stay engaged when they didn't have an opportunity or they had to, I mean, I guess they could have made that effort to contact their teacher, but oftentimes they won't, right? And so if, if there's a way for, to have that interaction on a regular basis that's already set up into the class, I think that can really be helpful where it's not like just an extra thing that they have to, you know, go out of their way to do. Um, they can really help motivation. Also, I don't, I would just wonder how many students are struggling psychologically, mentally, and, um, and some students really need. Um, it's back. Sorry. Oh, there, you're back. You're back. You're back. <laughs> Sorry, and I was just saying that I wish the university or the faculty had come up with some way for students to express some of the fears and concerns that they have. Maybe the a survey, or I don't, I don't know. But I think that um, I was just really struck by this person who had never met me before. Mm -hmm. um, just t was really clear about how how he was struggling and had struggled since the spring. Yeah, that's a good point. They they are kind of expected to to adapt and then don't have any way to express, you know, what they're going through and what what they're feeling or maybe process it maybe, you know, and then um, yeah, that's a good point, Jacqueline. Especially students who had to move back home because many of them had no actual physical space to work. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, giving tests online and watching parents walk through watching mm -hmm. their younger siblings come and talk to them while they're trying to take the test. Yep, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yep, I noticed that too. I wish there was more that we could do to help them. Yeah, it's like we, we need um, little hubs out in the community now that, that our students um, are being forced back home and, and don't necessarily, I don't even know if libraries have reopened because that would be the one place I would say, you know, go oh, there, my. there's internet. Our library is open and has been open. I was shocked. I found out like two weeks ago that our library has been open this whole time. Oh, wow. Because I know the a lot of them. The library or the city library? No, the campus, the university library, because I live in Conway and I usually go to CCU, but they're closed. So like once a week I go, I go to Francis Marion because the library is open, 8 to 530. Right. I knew our, our library has been open, but community libraries are closed. Yeah. That was a resource that a lot of our students would have taken advantage of because they would have had a computer, they would have had the internet, mm -hmm. they would have had a quiet place, but those have been closed to them. And so we need, um, we need some place within their communities where our students live that they can go if they don't have internet at home. And, and you know, now we're talking thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of millions of dollars in resources that we need, but... Right. That's where that would be the next step that this would have to take us down the road if we're if if the future of our, our lives is online and working with our students. But I think even acknowledging that they are having these difficulties would probably help them because they're out there feeling like they're alone and we just want the work. Mm -hmm. it's, it's part of the difficulty of not knowing if we're going to go online yes. right now is we can't say okay, there's an expectation of you having some technology available. If we go online once, we've, once we're in person already, then. Right. Uh, I made a, uh, a special, oh, why is it still on there? Anyway, it's bit.ly slash XD dash handouts. So that's the link to my Dropbox. Um, I made a bit.ly link so that you wouldn't get that really long, weird Dropbox URL. Um, or you can email me, cmasters at fbarian.edu if you want any of these templates um, or examples, if you find this useful. Yeah, good to talk to you all. Thank you for joining and you know, email me, um, message me. I'm actually in my office, you can call me. Actually, I said my, I set up my office phone to forward to my cell phone. Call me <laughs> if you want. Um, and uh, good luck with your planning. Uh, let me know if, if I can help with anything with the experience design um, tools. So thank you all. Thank you. Thanks.